ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll show you the variety of ways NCBA helps build beef demand, plus a report on the annual safety summit and how the industry is working to improve beef safety. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. Recently, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Army Corps of Engineers proposed an expansion of their federal authority over waters of the United States. Under this expansion, essentially all waters in the country would be subject to regulation by the EPA and the Corps, regardless of size or continuity of flow. NCBA is concerned about this expanded definition because it means almost all activities by cattle producers on open land will now touch a water of the U.S. And we have a lot of concerns about it because right now it looks like just about every body of water out there is going to be covered under this particular uh, proposal. So that means that producers may have to file to get a permit to use land that is around water on their very own property. And that's concerning to all of us in production agriculture. This is a proposed rule, so we have the opportunity to comment, but we need to make sure that there's a strong outcry from agriculture as a whole to tell EPA that this is a wrong move. The proposal will be open for public comment for 90 days and NCBA will submit comments on behalf of the producers it represents. Go to beefusa.org to find out more on how to contact the EPA and let them know your feelings about this proposal. Maintaining and growing consumer demand for beef is essential to the future of the industry. Today, we're gonna to spend most of our show focusing on the wide variety of work being done to build beef demand. Much of this work is carried out by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association as a primary contractor to the beef checkoff. We begin with some insights on the architecture of beef demand as Brian Baxter reports. Now more than ever, consumers of all ages want beef their way. There's not one product that's gonna satisfy every customer out there. Some people like grass-fed, some will like organic, uh, some folks like the rich, succulent prime beef. Uh, some people are value oriented and price is paramount and that's really a different product for each of those market segments and I think we have to recognize that we serve many different consumers. We need to coalesce and come together around our price value relationship and what does that mean to consumers? We have to continue to work hard to provide very high-end um, segments of our consuming population with what they want in terms of quality and excitement and differentiation, we can't forget what I call the value consumer. Because the value customer, someone who is looking for a lower price point, that's a huge percentage of our consuming public. One key focus of beef checkoff programs now is reaching millennials, those consumers between the ages of 14 and 35. Well, millennials are much more likely to try new foods, be willing to try um, to be influenced by their peers, uh, blogging, and um, they're in a new town, they're looking for a restaurant, they don't ask someone, they immediately Google or uh, look on their smartphone. And the millennials have introduced a whole new set of expectations relative to information, relative to traceability, relative to verification. And so I think it's all a matter, once again, of being able to recognize who that audience is, appropriately message the product, but make sure the product delivers on its promise, whether it's value, quality, yield, whatever that specific customer is, uh, those attributes they're looking for, the product does need to deliver. And, uh, and we're finding that those products that have a story to tell tend to command a bigger premium. Even with record retail beef prices last year, the data shows beef demand at retail did rise by about 2%. The goal is to keep that trend going by keeping millennial consumers choosing beef more often. I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Here with us now to talk about beef demand and consumer preferences is Mike Miller, the Senior Vice President at NCBA. Mike, tell us a little bit about the team you lead there at NCBA. Well, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate, Kevin. I've got a fantastic group of people that work every day to help increase and improve beef's worth 
in the eyes of the consumer. So we, we focus primarily um, in the work that we do for the Beef Checkoff Program in, in four main areas. We, we, we have uh, science and product solutions, which kind of goes to all of the research that we do. We've got uh, market research that looks at the consumer and those different trends that are taking place. We've got issues management, which uh, helps us work through our, uh, seems like, daily issues and crises that we face as an industry. And then we've got a group uh, of uh, communicators, our integrated communications team, um, that really works with retail and food service, direct to the consumer, all of those promotional items. So we've got a lot of different work going on in a lot of different areas. Um, and the exciting thing is that group of people really, really works well together. So we, we collaborate well. A lot of those programs are very well integrated. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really able to take it from kind of the research foundation that we've been a part of for a very, very long time and take it all the way through to the consumer in a meaningful way to help answer the questions that they have about beef how it's raised, taste profiles, all kinds of different things. And so why is this so important to beef producers? Well, it's important it, it, it simply that the consumer needs a, a good one-stop shop location to go for all the different questions that they have about beef. Um, we do a lot of foundational research, kinds of research that other folks just don't do. And so if the beef checkoff doesn't do that work, um, more than likely it's not going to get done and and so we've been over we've been able to over the course of time fill a bunch of research gaps um, that I think might have been created had it not been for the beef checkoff program that's uh, obviously paid for by producers here in the United States um, we do an awful lot of of interesting work and and look at the consumer uh, from a market research standpoint that again isn't put together to look at a specific brand of beef, but to look at beef in general. And, and again, we're the only group that does that kind of work for producers so that we can find out what's going on in the consumer's mind and, and try to help answer those questions that they have. Um, issues management is one that, that really is a, a, a tremendous asset for our industry. It seems like every day we're faced with another activist group or, or some kind of a beef recall. Um, we've got one location that we get together as an industry and talk about those things and, and try to find the best way forward. Mm -hmm. So again, we get the right information out to the right folks. Um, and then finally, our uh, uh, integrated communications team and all the work that they do, uh, again, a work that is done for beef in general, beef producers in general, uh, and, and really help the consumer get to those things that they really need. You know, looking for a recipe at the last minute, uh, we've got an answer for that. Um, and it, it, that focus has changed a little bit over the course of time, but again, I, I think that it's a very, very valuable program for producers today as it has been um, since 1985 when the program got started. So let's focus more specifically on demand building. You know, we talk a lot about the increasing price of beef and the need to really try to build demand and make that consumer want beef. Tell us about some of the specific work you're doing to continue to grow the demand for beef. Well, one of the things that we've done here in the last uh, six to nine months is we've really refined our focus. And so we're, we're focused an awful lot on the millennial generation. Um, so these are folks that are, you know, between say late 20s and early 40s that uh, in most cases have a young family and have a lot of questions about how and where beef fits in that diet for their family. Mm -hmm. um, and so with, with the, the decline in resources over time, it's, it's imperative that we focus. That's been the group that we've really worked hard on. Um, and the, the important thing is that the, the questions really aren't that much different today than they typically have been, you know, taste, tenderness, safety. So there, there's these, this, this bucket of, of questions that they've tended to have over time. But now the questions, especially from this group, go to how is the beef being produced? Mm -hmm. I have some questions about production, production practices. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've got to make sure that we're there and able to have that dialogue with those consumers. So I, I think overall, the, probably the biggest thing that they question today is price. Mm -hmm. um, and we've spent an awful lot of time in the last several years talking about price why it's increased and why it is where it is. 
Um, but once you get through that, fundamentally those questions tend to stay relatively standard um, and, and we're there to help them provide a solution to get those questions answered and hopefully make it easier for them to choose beef. You mentioned a lot about this millennial generation. I'm curious, uh, what are the other demand trends that you're following in terms of whether it be eating habits or eating preferences or, or, or what have you? Tell us about some of the other demand trends. Well, you know, it, it's interesting, Kevin. This group that we're, that we're really focused on right now, um, they tend to eat quite a little beef themselves. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to choosing beef for their children, that's where they run into some issues. So mm. convenience is a big one. For this generation, convenience is huge. Um, and so making sure that they understand that there's a lot of very convenient beef items, mm -hmm. a, a lot of very convenient beef preparation methods that in a lot of cases they're just not aware of. So inherently what they do when you think convenience in this day and age, they choose a lot of chicken. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to help them find ways and opportunities to, to utilize more beef and beef products. So that's, that's probably a big one right now. Um, you know, fundamentally, they, they've got a lot of questions about a lot of different things, mm -hmm. as I think all generations have in the past. Uh, but this one really wants to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, tell me about how you do this and, and, and how these, these animals were cared for. And, and so there's a lot of very interesting questions, a lot of very interesting dialogue that takes place with those consumers. I've got a few more questions for you, and we're going to continue our conversations with Mike Miller right after this commercial break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Whether you're feeding cattle, milking cows, or baling hay, the work on your farm is never done, which is why you need equipment that works as hard as you do. Get the efficiency and versatility you need with Case IH. From farm all compact and utility tractors to balers and mowers, all Case IH equipment is designed with one thing in mind, getting the job done. To learn more, visit caseih.com livestock. We don't sit idle, wondering how we're gonna build a better truck. We get out there and walk a mile, thousands of miles, in the footsteps of the guys we build trucks for. The groundbreaking Ram Heavy Duty, with 30,000 pounds of towing and 850 pound feet of torque. Senior Vice President at NCBA is with us discussing the important program work that uh, he and his staff do. Mike, we were talking about demand uh, drivers and specifically consumer preferences, and I'm curious to know how are some of those changing preferences we were talking about really impacting the overall demand for our product? Well, there's a lot of different moving parts. I think one of the things that we've done a great job here over time, uh, especially from a fundamental or foundational research standpoint, is focusing on those things that we would consider to be table stakes. One of of those is beef safety. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we sometimes take that for granted, especially when we go through a period of time where we don't have any big recalls or we don't have anything that's popping in the media. But we've got a team of folks at work every day at NCBA that are consistently looking for those things that might be what's next, what's coming at us. And I wanted to ask you that question. So what are specifically some of the safety issues that you're working on? You've made tremendous progress in E. coli. What are some of the other issues? Well, it's, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned E. coli. That's a, that's a work that, that I think our industry will always look at as kind of a work in progress. Yeah. Um, there's uh, a lot of different things going on there, a lot of different research that continues there, but we do. We, our industry has done a fantastic job of getting a handle specifically on E. coli. Uh, the next one we're probably going to be talking about is salmonella. Now, salmonella is typically uh, an issue that is uh, 
tied to other proteins, not necessarily beef, but we do think that we've got some reasons to really investigate and find out what's going on with salmonella and beef uh, before it ever gets to a point where it's a real big issue for us. So it's, it's, it's part of my team's job and I think the beef checkoff and producer's job to make sure that we're looking forward. And I think that's one area that we're really focused on uh, and probably will be for the next several years to make sure that we're ahead of the curve on that one. Earlier today uh, in the interview, you talked about the, the, the role you play in research. And as we look to the future of beef demand and think about future cuts and future cooking options, can you tell us more about some of the research priorities you have? Yeah, you know, we, we just walked through beef safety. Beef safety is obviously one that we'll, we'll always be focused on. Um, we do spend a lot of time with the product, you know, looking at new solutions, trying to find new cuts or new, um, new ways to prepare. So we've got a, a group of culinarians that really work every day trying to find what's next. And they, they spend a lot of time um, looking at trends globally. You know, what's the next big, big trend in, in, uh, in, in culinary, uh, talking to a lot of different chefs from around the world. And so they really focus on watching all of those different things because that does tend to come home to roost here in the United States and does have an impact on overall demand profile for beef. Um, kind of a new area that we've been spending some time on is sustainability. Again, it mm -hmm. goes back to these questions about production and, and kind of where we're headed, our footprint as an industry. And um, I think that we'll be glad to know that we've got a very good and strong positive story to tell there, but that's that's science that is is really just kind of emerging now. So I think that our industry will spend some additional time looking into that over the course of time, but I think right now it's an area that um, we've done a lot of very good foundational work, mm -hmm. and we'll probably have to continue over time. But again, a real good positive story coming out of all those different areas. And I, and I last but not least is, is nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we've got a big year coming up. We've got another look at uh, the U.S.'s nutritional guidelines. Um, and, and we want to make sure that the research that has been done is in a good enough, tidy enough package for those people that are gonna be making those recommendations so that they keep beef front and center as a protein option in those guidelines. So um, awful lot of work going on and, and uh, we could spend all day talking about all the different programs in, from a research standpoint, but those are some highlights, some high level um, items that we're working on over time and, and I think the real important ones for producers. So what else would you add as you look to the future for NCBA in the next couple of years? Uh, what do you see as some of the key priorities, Mike? You know, I think, I think we've done a good job as a team, as an industry, in, in partnership with, with all of the volunteer leaders that we've got out there to really look forward and make sure that we stay kind of on the cutting edge where uh, consumers are headed, where the questions are headed, where you know some of these beef safety kinds of things are headed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that you know from a uh, integrated communication standpoint, we're going to really focus on that millennial generation and trying to find what makes them tick. How can we get them to believe that beef is fundamental to their diet? And, and we want them to make sure that they choose beef more and more often as we go through time. Mm -hmm. uh, we gotta make sure from, a, from an issues management standpoint that we stay on top of all the issues of the day and look forward and, and hopefully find those things that uh, we can address before they become issues for our industry. Um, research, we spend a lot of time talking about research. I think we've got a lot of great work there. Uh, and again, a group of people that are really focused on what's next as opposed to being in a re reactionary position. And then our, our market research folks are always hard at work trying to uncover the next gem uh, as it relates to uh, where the consumer's mind is, where they might be headed. Uh, and I think uh, that work is going to continue to help us prepare for um, all of the different movements that we need to take as we go down the road. Our, our group and our industry has to be very, very focused. Mm -hmm. These resources are extremely valuable to both us and our producers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we're doing a great job of, of making sure that those resources are focused in the right areas. Well, as a beef producer, I really appreciate all that you and your team does for uh, driving demand for beef. And I wish you all the best of luck in the future, Mike. Thank you, sir. To find out more about all the efforts to build beef demand, visit our website. That's cattlemantocattlemen.org. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
no storm is too powerful for Neopurina wind and rain storm minerals, formulated with ultimate weather resistance. That means more minerals in the feeder and available to your cattle. Wind and rain storm minerals provide more consistent intake and balanced mineral nutrition to optimize herd health and breedback rates. See the difference at your local Purina dealer or visit CattleNutrition.com. Wind and rain storm minerals, another way Purina is building better cattle. This business can take time away and become more of your family than your actual family. My days were tough. I had a lot of doctoring, a lot of pulling. Now our days on the feed yard are happy days. It's more about looking at the cattle and enjoying what we're producing versus the alternative which is pull and treat and bang our head against the wall. We have never wavered from Draxon. We've seen the benefits just keep getting better and better. Welcome back. Food safety has been a long-standing priority for the beef industry. Recently, the 2014 Beef Industry Safety Summit was held to continue the groundbreaking work of supplying the safest beef possible for our consumers. This event, partially funded by the Beef Checkoff, marked its 12th year of dedication to improving beef safety. Cattleman and Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter tells us more. Consumers demand a safe, wholesome protein source, and the Beef Industry Food Safety Council is committed to finding new ways to improve the safety of beef. The Beef Industry Safety Summit, held in Dallas, brought together researchers and representatives from every segment of the beef industry. I feel like that uh, food safety in general is a responsibility for um, the entire chain, not just for uh, those are that are focused on the meat case or the menu. So what that means broken down is that whatever we can do in an entire supply chain from uh, the beginning where the calf is born all the way through where they're fed, where they're grown, where they're harvested, where they're disassembled, where they're actually made available um, at the meat case or on a menu. Everybody has a responsibility relative to food safety in that entire chain. So it's, it's not a segment responsibility, it's a systems responsibility. Safety has always been a priority for the beef industry, so um, events like this allow the dialogue to happen between those of us that do research, producers, other segments of the industry to all come together and, and try to find solutions for improving safety. Food safety is a shared issue where food sa safety successes benefit everyone in the industry and the industry wants to find ways to do things better and doing better means keeping vigilant and, and really looking for control of these foodborne pathogens. In the past, work to improve beef safety was often focused on the packer and retail level, but producers are taking a more active role and are seeking ways to improve beef safety starting on their own operations. Several beef producers attended the Safety Summit to learn about the latest research and technologies. This conference is a great conference. Me as a cattle producer, I've already learned a great deal and I look forward to learning more about the, the general concept of food safety. If there's new technology that's being made available or being discovered around food safety and what we can do on the pre-harvest side, that's a great opportunity for, for me to be a better cattle producer and a better member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA, as a contractor to the beef checkoff, is committed to help the beef industry provide safe beef to consumers. NCBA's dedication to improving beef safety is yet another membership benefit and creates value for all beef producers. The NCBA is important to me personally. I'm a member, I have been for a long time, I'm a cattle producer, uh, but as a organization, it really is the voice of many people like me uh, where they get to deliver the message but they also are engaged in the issues that affect cattle producers and food safety is fundamentally important when it comes to uh, cattle production and beef production. It really is the price of admission and NCBA being engaged in food safety and being engaged in meetings like this is critically important uh, because it helps improve the safety of beef 
it helps convey the message that the uh, beef is a safe product and it is a wholesome product and that is reflected in the price that all people receive uh, in the beef value chain. At the Beef Safety Summit in Dallas, Texas, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Joining us now to talk more about beef safety and research is Mandy Carr, Executive Director of Science and Product Solutions at NCBA. Mandy, tell us a little bit about the team you lead and specifically some of what you do as a team. Sure, our team is called Science and Product Solution and it's made up of our group of technically trained research scientists that really lead the traditional research programs. We also have a group that leave our innovative beef solutions as well as our trained culinary staff and they work to develop new beef recipes and ways to prepare beef that really meets the consumer's needs of today and follows culinary trends which is part of the expectation today. And you mentioned research, specifically what areas of research are your uh, team focusing on right now? So from a traditional standpoint of research, we really focus on those that have been the foundation of the checkoff, mm -hmm. as well as for NCBA for many years. And that includes things like beef safety research. So a real focus on uh, finding solutions, particularly in pre-harvest to make beef safer. Mm -hmm. Additionally, uh, product quality research, so tenderness, juiciness, flavor, expectations of a consumer. Nutrition, so really how does beef fit in a healthy diet? As well as sustainability, so proving that beef is a sustainable protein choice for consumers today. Now, man, I know that beef safety is an area that you are personally very passionate and quite expert in. Uh, what are some of the key areas that uh, you're focusing your ongoing research uh, in terms of beef safety? Well, you know, our program started back in the early 90s on beef safety, and it really focused on E. coli. Mm -hmm. and we know that that's continued to be a challenge for the industry, and so we worked for both pre- and post-harvest solutions, really finding ways to reduce the likelihood that cattle will carry E. coli um, in the live setting, as well as transfer them when they reach the processing plant. More recently, what we've done is shifted some focus to salmonella. And you may say, salmonella, that's not a beef issue. But we know from research that it can be. So mm -hmm. looking at solutions to reduce the likelihood that cattle would carry salmonella, mm -hmm. and then, then when they transfer to the processing plant, reduce that likelihood that that would ever reach a final product that a consumer would buy. You know, uh, beef safety is one of those things that, different than some of the other issues in our industry, it, it, it really is something that it is not meant to be a competitive advantage for one company or over another. It really is something that we should all be focused on. Uh, tell us how that's impacted the work you do from a beef safety standpoint. You know, when you look back over time, when the industry had its first challenges in the late 80s and early 90s, um, it was something that they decided that it really was to no one's advantage uh, for anybody to have a safety problem. Mm -hmm. So they came together and did set safety aside as a non-competitive issue, which is a unique um, decision for the beef industry. Mm -hmm. So what they've done over time is they, the industry comes together, fund research, they share their learnings from failures, as well as when they've had success, so that everybody can gain from that knowledge. And that's really been a model that's been held up to other food industries as a way to approach uh, safety challenges. Well, as you look at the landscape ahead for the beef industry, uh, what do you perceive to be some of the biggest research priorities moving forward? You know, research is a very fun, it's a dynamic and ever-changing uh, field, but it's one that takes patience uh, to do it right. And that's something we're really uh, strive to do. The good thing is, is we have some really great process for input to make sure that we take producers' input through our checkoff committees on safety, health and nutrition, all the way to freedom to operate, on what are the key issues that they believe are important, all the way to engaging with industry experts to make sure that the programs we do actually are implementable for the industry. So we work through all those pieces and where we're headed, I think, in two great examples is really trying to understand what causes inconsistency in flavor when you sit down and have a great beef meal. Mm -hmm. Other options are things like how do we prove with science that the practices producers use every day to manage their pastures or to formulate their rations do prove that beef is a sustainable product. Because mm. that's important for our retailers and uh, food service that sell our product to consumers every day. Well, Mandy, you have an exciting and incredibly important job. Thank you for all you and the rest of your team do for the beef industry. Thank you. To find out more about NCBA's beef safety efforts, just visit the Center for Research and Knowledge Management's website at beefresearch.org. 
Still to come on Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll talk with two leading beef researchers about the effort to create leaner beef. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is yours. And so is what grows there. Not theirs or theirs, yours. You need this to fight this and this to grow more this. Because the more of this you feed them, the less this you spend on that, which leaves more of this here. Don't let them take this from you. Chaparral takes care of weeds and brush, and that's that. Here to 10-11. I'm tuning to Nova 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 Welcome back to Cattleman to Cattleman. I'm Kevin Auctioner. This year, the Beef Checkoff published Lean Matters, a booklet that chronicles beef's four-decade evolution to a leaner product. It's a collaborative effort between the Beef Checkoff, USDA, and leading research universities. Here to discuss Lean Matters are two people who were involved in the project, Dr. Keith Belk and Dr. Dale Warner of Colorado State University. Gentlemen, thanks for coming to the show. Oh, thank you. Dr. Belk, I'd begin with you. Uh, let's go back to the 70s and 80s. I remember that campaign, the war on fat. What were the key drivers that caused the beef industry to really focus on the war on fat? Well, for many decades after World War II, we'd produced cattle that were pretty fat. Um, you know, uh, I remember cattle when we were showing when I was young that were short and, and they were pretty obese. And starting in probably the 1970s, maybe the uh, early 1970s, consumers started to express displeasure with the fatness of beef. Uh, they were becoming a lot more health conscious. Mm -hmm. And of course, foods that were high in fat content just were not satisfactory any longer. And so they initiated, the industry initiated a campaign mm -hmm. to remove that fat from the beef product and address consumers' needs and wishes. So uh, for 40 years now, we've been working on uh, developing new technologies that would improve the uh, nutritional content of beef. So what were some of the tools, the decisions that beef producers used to begin winning the war on fat? Yeah, I think as we look back 40 years and in the introduction of the dietary guidelines, we've seen a reduction of fat genetically and improving the genetics of cattle, introducing uh, European breeds of cattle to reduce mm -hmm. fat. Also some feedlot technologies and feeding cattle differently to different endpoints and using feed additives to achieve that as well. Anything else that you would add, Dr. Belk? Uh, we've, we've done a really good job even at the packing plant level of the industry. The packers today remove all of the external fat that's on um, the cuts of beef that are then sent out as box beef to retailers. Um, the other thing that's happened is there's a lot more boneless product offered for sale in retail display cases today. And so when you make products boneless, that gives the packers the opportunity to take more of that fat off while it's in the packing plant. Now, I understand the, uh, the, the project Lean Matters really chronicles the advancements and the progress we've made over the years. Maybe highlight some of the key elements of that report. I think Dr. Belk touched on one of the primary ones, and that's fat trim. Mm -hmm. And at the retail level, we've seen fat trim uh, decreased drastically anywhere mm. from a half inch, quarter inch, and now to eighth inch or even zero inch trim. Wow. And I believe that has the, the largest impact on the overall fatness of the cuts, the overall nutritional profile of the cuts, reducing both total fat and saturated fat in the diet, which are the two primary concerning fats for most all consumers. Mm -hmm. and, and why does this information matter? Why should our viewers be concerned about and interested in uh, this whole uh, research effort that chronicles our great progress in this area. The most recent change in the meat industry from a regulatory perspective is mandatory nutritional labeling. Mm. 
This information resulting from the research that we've conducted along with Texas A&M and Texas Tech University has updated the standard reference. That standard reference is now used as the primary source for nutritional labels of single ingredient meat products. Uh, dietitians, health professionals, and individual consumers use that information on the label and uh, published elsewhere to make daily uh, consumption decisions, daily health decisions, etc. Any other benefits that you see, Dr. Belt? Well, I think that this gives uh, the entire industry an opportunity to market some additional features that are associated with beef. Uh, in 1990, there were only seven cuts that were classified as lean by USDA standards mm -hmm. of beef. Today, there's over 38. Wow. And so that gives the consumer a lot more opportunities uh, to include beef in the diet, but still uh, purchase a product that's extremely lean and healthful. Well, thank you so much for coming. I'm anxious to get my hands on that uh, Lean Matters uh, report. You can check out the USDA database yourself. Just visit the website ndb.nal.usda.gov. There you'll find nu nutrient information on over 8,000 foods. Still ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll check in with our good friend Baxter Black plus another visit to the kitchen for a beef recipe that's sure to warm me up on a cold spring day. Stay with us, we'll be right back. This isn't a job, it's a calling. Your hard work helps feed the world. Being linked to those who care for the land is our calling. For more than 175 years, John Deere has been a proud partner of the cattle business. That's why we bring you special NCBA member discounts, so you can get the right equipment. Strong, rugged, versatile, and ready to work hard. Talk to your John Deere dealer to learn more about your NCBA member discounts. John Deere, committed to the land, committed to your success. Hello, I'm Kevin Oxner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Each week, we travel the country to bring you the latest cattle industry news and information. Check us out at cattlemen2cattlemen.org or on Facebook and Twitter. We're back in the kitchen with Laura Majors, one of the recipe testers from the Beef Culinary Center. And Laura, I see you brought the slow cooker with you today. You know, we use a slow cooker a lot in our household. Why do you think it's become such a popular way to uh, fix beef? Yeah, Kevin, it's a popular way because you can take some of the uh, larger cuts from the shoulder, from the rump, from the round, and you can cook it all day and come home and at least part of the dinner's already made. You bet. And then you can, the reason we call it four-way is that you can take that beef, shred it, and then add different sauces or different ingredients oh to finish it off with a, to a lot of different flavors from different cultures. And we're gonna show you four different ways to prepare it quickly. Well, that sounds very exciting, let's get started. Okay, the first thing we wanna do is make sure that the beef is done. Okay. Um, we, we use what we call fork tender. Uh -huh. You're gonna pull the pieces out of the slow cooker yep. and you put it on like this, but I want you to see how oh, wow. easy this sure. fork goes in, and that's fork done. Very good. And then to shred it, you can just take a couple of table forks mm -hmm. and pull it apart, oh, yeah. and you can see how easy that Stop pulls pull apart. apart. Sure. And you'll want to do that to the whole roast. Okay. And then you can make several dinners with this, or one, depending on how many people you have to feed. Okay. And so now you've already got some shredded roast beef, it right. looks like. Yeah, we have a little bit shredded here. We're going to show you the Indian, uh, East Indian way that we would do this. We're going to add just a little tiki masala sauce. Okay. Stir it up mm -hmm. in there. And then this is what it's going to look like. Just sauce, and depending Most on beef. your finish, 
that's you're going to use either salsa or tiki masala or for a Mexican dish you could use any of your salsas sure. or Mexican sauces. Um, barbecue sauce also sure. works and then you'd want to cover this up put it in the microwave for a minute to heat everything up. You might have to stir it once, put it back in, and then your meat is all heated. And for those people who want to go around the world uh, while staying in the comfort of their own home, you've got several different alternatives right, for we us. we do, and this is great to show kids how to cook, so they're going to get a lot of different ideas about what they can eat from different cultures, mm -hmm. and with this one piece of beef, you can do several have a party and roll out a whole bunch of different sauces from different countries and well, ingredients. Well, well tell us about these. Okay, thanks. Um, this is an Asian piece. It's got some hoisan sauce. You can also mm. use teriyaki, mix that in. It also has some cucumbers, a uh, few peanuts, and some carrots. Okay. Then moving on to the barbecue Perfect. sauce. It's a barbecue sandwich, whole mm -hmm. grain bun, very healthy for your family. Um, What's in the pita? The pita, and you can also use non bread, okay. would be the East Indian oh. preparation that we prepared. Okay. And add some yogurt, some pistachio nuts, some of your other vegetables. Interesting. And Wonderful finally, we've sandwich. got it looks like a uh, kind of a Mexican burrito. Yeah, it could be a taco, it could be a burrito. Uh, shredded beef is really good with Mexican food. Add some avocados, some tomatoes, some onions, and there you have it. So folks Very that easy. want to do multiple alternatives for the same meal or just not eat leftovers over and over and create some variety in leftovers, this is a great option. Yeah, it is. it really is. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Kevin. For this and other outstanding beef recipes, visit the website beefitswhatsfordinner.com or you can always find them on our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. Its arrival is as routine as the truck that brings the next load of calves. You stand ready, waiting, watching for symptoms. A revolutionary new weapon in hand. Unique chemistry and hard-hitting active ingredient. Longer duration in the respiratory tract. Rapid absorption. Join the Zuprevolution. Zuprevo, Tilda Pearson. See your veterinarian. Tough trailers built for tough country. Big Bend Trailers manufactures a different kind of trailer, one that's built to put up with the rough conditions found on the ranch. Rugged build using heavy gauge powder coated steel and a two by four rectangle tube frame. There's a one inch gap between the side and floor, so there's no place for water or manure to accumulate and rust. Big Bend Trailers are loaded with standard features, a lever action hitch, a three foot escape gate and a middle sorting gate, rhino lining along the front edges and a receiver hitch to tow another trailer, chute or other equipment. Tough and practical, that's Big Ben Trailers, designed and built by a working cattleman. You can rely on and trust Big Ben Trailers for their durability and convenient features. Reasonably priced for any rancher to afford. For a list of dealers and other design features, visit BigBenTrailers.com. Big Ben Trailers, built cattlemen tough. We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted. Working your cattle just got easier. Introducing the new Vet Gun Delivery System, a new way to apply topical insecticides to your cattle. The Vet Gun lets you remotely treat cattle with effective parasite control, so you can do it from an ATV, on horseback, or just walking among the herd. It's that simple. The proven topical insecticide AML Vet Cap is used with the Vet Gun. It works fast to control horn flies and lice while minimizing stress on your cattle. Fast, easy, effective. Vet Gun. Check with your animal health supplier for availability. 
Now whoever built this crowding pen had built a real butte, but it's obvious he'd never put a critter through the chute. They were flooding all around us in this cowboy cul-de-sac when a big old redneck mama mounted my old pony from the back. My rope tied to the saddle horn uncoiled like a snake and dallied round my boot that I'd kicked free for safety's sake when a passing horned intruder speared my catch loop from the air. In retrospect, I believe my luck was all downhill from there. Being caught between a bucking horse who's finally jumped the fence and a pig-eyed cow who stood her ground in sullen self-defense. I was somewhere in the middle as they dragged me back and forth with my right arm waving Dixie and my boots a-pointing north. I was getting full of splinters and my clothes began to smoke like a Mexican riata when the nylon finally broke. <laughs> I awoke to see the doctor's flashlight peering in my eyes. He'd apparently detected life and begun to improvise a test to check my brain involving trigonometry. In a soothing voice, he asked, what's 97 minus three? Well, I stared back at him dumbly with a blank look in my eyes. I'm afraid, the doc concluded, he's begun to stupefy. I said, doc, just hold your horses, this really ain't quite fair. I can read a brand blindfolded just by feeling of the hair. I can spot a raw imposter, be he saddle horse or man, and always find Polaris, track a lizard in the sand. I can count a pen of cattle that come pounding through the gate and never miss a single steer. Doc, I can tell you what they ate. Ask me how to treat a gravel or who's winning all around. There's lots of stuff I savvy that'll prove my brain still sound, but you're concluding that I'm daft upstairs. Just a lame brain buckaroo. I'd have passed your test if you'd asked me something that I knew. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. We always enjoy your humor. Don't go away. We'll have more right after this. New Holland is smart for the way you farm. And New Holland round balers are smart for the way you raise cattle. By focusing on making the densest bale possible, New Holland round balers pack more into each bale, saving you time, fuel, and money. Now that's smart. We can also match your feeding requirements with a variety of bale slicing, cutting, and wrapping options to help maximize your time. Plus, with models designed specifically for silage or specialty crop harvest, New Holland gives you the power to make smart choices to fit your farm or ranch. You work hard to get the most out of every hay season to benefit you and your cattle. From mower conditioners to balers and tractors, New Holland has the right solutions to help you make quality hay and forage for your cattle operation. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more about the complete lineup of New Holland equipment, in addition to all the benefits available to cattle producers. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattlemen is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattlemen. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today. Welcome back. March 25th was a chance to say thanks to the farmers and ranchers that provide food, feed, and fiber for all of America. Cattlemen and Cattlemen reporter Brad Bulla has a closer look at National Ag Day and why it's so important to have an event like this to recognize agriculture. Hundreds of agriculture advocates came together in Washington, D.C. to help celebrate National Ag Day. 
The goal of this annual event is to help Americans understand how food and fiber are produced and what impact agriculture has on our daily lives and the economy. National Ag Day is 41 years old, and it's a great program that's been in place and sponsored by the Agriculture Council of America to work to try to make the connection between all the hardworking men and women on farms and ranches around this country and the policymakers here in Washington, D.C., and the consumers. This event is about making sure that we have the opportunity here in our nation's capital and around the country to celebrate the industry of agriculture and make sure that we have the opportunity to advocate um, to those who are in positions of leadership here in our country. Attendees enjoyed a day full of events and activities highlighting agriculture's importance. Members of FFA and other youth groups joined in the celebration and some of them visited Capitol Hill to share their views with lawmakers. We bring in 4-H'ers, FFA'ers, and the Ag Future of America students to town to also engage in this process because they need to learn at an early age that you have to be a part of this process in order to influence it. I'm definitely looking forward to being able to mix and mingle with the different representatives and congressmen that are here today at the uh, luncheon. It's really cool to be able to sit down and show them that we're passionate about different things, about different aspects of agriculture, and show them how much we care about this. Sometimes it's nice to just kind of casually catch up with them, say thanks for the relationship that we have together, um, and just kind of explain to them again why it is that we love agriculture. Right now, the global population stands at 7 billion people. And over the course of the next 40 years, the Earth's total population will increase to more than 9 billion. An event like Ag Day is important to remind everyone the role that agricultural producers will play to help meet the demand. We're going to have 9.5 billion people by the year uh, 2050, and uh, we got to figure out a way to become uh, even more productive to be able to feed this uh, growing world uh, population. And so it's extremely important that we explain why we do what we do to raise the crops, to raise the animals that we do in the United States, and the solutions we have for feeding that growing world population. National Ag Day is all about celebrating and recognizing the role agriculture plays in providing safe, abundant, and affordable products. Although the spotlight shines brightest on this day, it's important to remember that farmers and ranchers work hard 365 days a year. We really need to make sure that we are communicating beyond ourselves. Connecting the dots is what I call it, and making sure that everyone knows and understands about agriculture. Every time we go to the grocery store, every time we see a farmer uh, on the street, we need to think about just everything that's done by agriculturalists in all parts of the uh, production side, to the marketing side, to the distribution. Everybody plays a role in this industry, and uh, that's something to celebrate. Reporting from National Ag Day in Washington, D.C., I'm Brad Bullifort, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. The Beef Quality Assurance Program provides guidelines and training about best practices in beef production. You can get BQA certified and it's free for a limited time, just one more week through April 15th, with sponsorship from Beringer Ingelheim Vit Medica Incorporated. Now to start the process, just visit the website bqa.org forward slash team. Next week on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll sit down with our friends from Dow AgriSciences, hear what the experts have to say on how to get more production from existing forage areas without sacrificing the long-term health of your land. Plus, a demonstration of the proper use of a backpack sprayer. All that and much, much more, including another visit with our friend Baxter Black. Well, that's our time for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.